Welcome to the Matt Lairdsey Project. This is a show about all things real estate, business, marketing, and entrepreneurship. Each show consists of myself, Matt Lairdsey, a member of my team, and a guest. This week, the Matt Lairdsey Group team member joining us is Joe Ruick. Joe, how are we doing today? Doing all right. Sun's out. Sun's out. Yeah, that's exciting for you. You're How, how far away are you from uh, becoming an official Stalin? Uh, July 8th. July 8th, he marries one of my wife's sisters. So it's, it's coming up here quick. And episode 20 is called The Growth of Marijuana Companies with Cresco Labs. And today we have Joe Caltabiano with us. Joe? Hi, Matt. How are you, buddy? Good. Good to see you. I struggle with your last name all the time, I know time, you still, you've done it for years, but you get through it. You yeah, know, the, the outcome is good, but yeah. it, it is very deliberate. I prefer just Joey C. Yeah, okay. You know? Joey like, C. Joey C. Got like, I, I think if your name's Joe, I like Joey. Joey okay, Cresco. You know? Yeah, Joey, right. yeah, Joey Cresco. Fine. <laughs> yeah. Joey Rates. I've been Joey Rates before, and I'm Joey, sure we'll get into that, but... Joey Rates, that yeah. That was uh, an early nickname. So, and, and we got to know each other because uh, you used to be uh, the number one lender in the state, pretty much, right? Yeah, I chased you around a bunch of YPN events. Yeah. I kept telling you you should work with me. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You kept telling me no, yes. no, no, until you needed like a condo done. Correct. And all of a sudden, you were there. Knocking, then I was your best friend. Sent me flowers. Said, yeah. Please, please. With chocolates. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did uh, 20 non-warrantable condos for you as bailouts, and then we actually started to do real business together. Correct. Yeah. So uh, it was a very need-based relationship. To it was. Start. It, yeah. It was a, a need needs on both sides. So uh, so we started working together, and then um, obviously you you've you've worked really big at um, you know guaranteed rate, and then B loan. But what made you pivot to moving to Cresco? Yeah, so I saw this industry, um, myself and my partners, um, Rob Sampson, Charlie Bachtel, and Dom Sergi, um, when cannabis was starting out to, to kind of go east of the Mississippi, right? It's always had a culture in Colorado and California. Yeah. Then you started seeing states like Michigan pass a law. Yeah. Um, I looked at it at that time. That was probably like 2012 but it was way too unregulated. Mm -hmm. And myself and my partners were always looking at other business opportunities and ventures and invested in various things. And when uh, Governor Quinn passed the law, you know, we started to, to look at this more materially. And um, it, was, it was the change in how cannabis was going to look in Illinois that got us excited about it. It was a regulated format, right? And what we experienced in the mortgage industry drew a lot of parallels to cannabis. Um, the mortgage industry went from an unregulated industry to right. a hyper-regulated industry overnight, right? When yep. you're basically blamed for the global economics collapse, you can imagine that regulation comes flying at you from every which way. Right. Cannabis was going to go from unregulated to hyper-regulated very quickly. That was exciting for us because we were part of growing guaranteed rate from a few hundred employees to 3,500 employees. And the, the team and the leadership was able to do that on a state-by-state -state basis mm -hmm. while using regulation as some way to outpace our peers. So going from those parallels, that was kind of what uh, drew us toward this, and the opportunity seemed uh, pretty material. So I see, I always say that, like, the people who are the most successful are the ones that can see the patterns. So you saw the patterns in the past in the mortgage and started seeing the, more, uh, the patterns kind of, be similar in the, in the cannabis industry. Yeah, we draw a lot of parallels to it. And then yeah. in addition, like on the personal side, I had leukemia as a kid. Yeah. So having gone through cancer and being involved in long-term cancer follow-up and a lot of the charity work that you've done, I've, yeah. you know, certainly have, I've received Make-A-Wish. So like yeah, kudos yeah. to big, you guys for doing all that. Josie's always been a big supporter charity of stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, seeing the long, as I go in for long-term cancer follow-up at like Northwestern and seeing the evolution of how doctors talk about cannabis of, you know, from 10 years ago where they would say it really doesn't do much to five years ago when I started to get in this space, them saying a lot of the people in the waiting room were utilizing cannabis to help yeah. with the nausea from chemo. Seeing these people that I revere, right, the oncologists who ultimately saved my life, yeah. um, start encouraging or, or, or at least not, not down-talking the benefits of it, you knew there was some evolution here that was going to happen. Uh, and I was in the right place at the right time and had great partners yeah. Uh, to start looking at doing it. So, so so you said there's there's four partners total, right? So there were four founding partners, and then a fifth really came on, right? As we, like the first dollar we ever raised um, was a gentleman by the name of Brian McCormick, and Brian was very early on and, and really is a founder as well. So the five of us put the Cresco team together and, and uh, kind of went from and there. And you're all like equal shares or? Yeah, well, everybody has similar economic Does interests. Any, can anybody trump one or the other? We all have similar voting authority. Okay. So some of us have different amounts of shares. It, what I'll say is it's it's very similar from that standpoint. 
Um, as with any partnerships, you have a lot of, of puts and takes, as yeah. I would say. Yeah. Uh, we all have kind of equal voting rights, um, and that's got us through to where we are. And we've almost everything we've ever done has been a unanimous decision. Where and did, where how did, did you yeah? How did how did you come together with with the group of them? And sure. are they all so, from the mortgage business? No. Or? No. So. Um, uh, Charlie was uh, in the mortgage business with me. Rob was in the mortgage business with me. Dom, I actually met through the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So Dom Sergi's um, been in commercial and industrial real estate development, uh, been a longtime friend. Again, met through philanthropic activities, became very close friends. Um, so myself, Rob, and Charlie came from mortgage. Dom came from commercial industrial. And then Brian was actually involved in inner workings, Echo Global Logistics, Groupon, and um, has taken, you know, been a part of multiple companies going public. So it was kind of the early financial um, brain, so to speak, of of all of us. So we all had unique skills, right? I came from the sales side. Charlie came from the legal uh, background side. Rob came from an operations background. Dom came from a, a real estate side. Brian came from a, a operations and a finance side. So between all of us, we had a pretty good little team put together. Where did you guys come up with the name Cresco? I think Dom gets credit for it. We still go back and forth. What happened was when we started to get in this space, uh, what we realized very quickly was the fact that um, we didn't know how to grow cannabis. So yeah. we needed to find somebody who knew how to grow cannabis. Like we yeah. couldn't read books. Yeah. So we were flying out to Denver to go like interview kind of operating people for yeah. the company and yeah. flying out there or flying back. And I don't remember which um, we were talking about a name. And, uh, you know, you go through all these iterations and it's hard to find a name and then a URL and all that. Yeah. So then you go into like Latin and, and all these other languages. Right. So Cresco means to grow in Latin. Huh. So there's actually a little background there. But uh, I yeah. think Dom came up with um, with uh, Cresco. I always think about Crisco. Crisco, you know? yeah. You know, okay. the, the... When I open a pizza place, it's going to be called Crusco. I think that was the that's, winner. That's on actually, that's a, that post. would actually be a phenomenal yeah, name right. for a pizza so. place. So, um, okay, so you got involved with this. I, I do kind of feel like, oh, oh, you know, and backing that up, like, what is your role at the company? So, like, what is your day-to-day? -day? Like, what, do, what, do you, what are you so responsible for? So, as president for? of the company, um, I'm responsible for uh, revenue Do they call generating. you Mr. Pres when they Mr. come in? Mr. President. Right. Yeah, yeah, we had a, yeah. by the way, for our viewers out there, we had a red carpet rolled yeah. in, but it, it just, it, it wasn't out in time for them. Um, so, as president of the company, my job is revenue generation okay. is really what I, I focus on. So, our wholesale team, meaning we do... The majority of our revenue is B2B transactions, us selling to dispensaries. Yep. And then we also have retail stores. So uh, the B2C transaction, right, where the consumer uh, interacts. So I head up those two teams. Uh, I'm involved in our capital markets, so meaning out, talking to investors, kind of the investor relationship side. Um, you know, as a board member, you're kind of looking at uh, all of the other components of the business. But revenue generation is really where my uh, head is at most of the time for the company. What do you like more about working in the cannabis industry compared to like the mortgage industry? Because you were very, very influential in the state and in the country overall for, for mortgages. Yeah, I mean, and I love mortgage. What I, what I know about myself is when I find something, I dive in and, and you know, work as hard as possible at it and try to become an expert in the field. And, and I feel like I did accomplish that in the mortgage business. Yeah. Make no mistake, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I loved every aspect of where I worked throughout my career and, and really it built the lifestyle that you know I've, I've grown accustomed to. So I, I loved every bit about it. What's exciting about this is when you look at um, a multitude of different things, you look at how cannabis is going to interact with all of us yeah. in the next 10 years. Right, whether it's a wellness or lifestyle product that helps people sleep better, eat better, whether it's a play type replacement for that glass of scotch at the end of the day, yeah. or to create some euphoric feelings, or as real money and real industry starts dumping into this, the, the medical research that can be done, mm -hmm. there's something to this plant that is fascinating, that is helping people with epilepsy, cancer, all of these things, but it's gonna take billions and billions of dollars in research. So if you can disrupt the pharmaceutical world, if you can disrupt the nutraceutical world, you can disrupt the alcohol, food, and beverage world. Um, those are some pretty dynamic things that I've never seen a, a product yeah. that can touch on all of those aspects. And you know, as Cresco grows, you know, we started out more on the medical side, and now it's really more of a wellness and lifestyle company. Because what you're seeing is cannabis, if you look at this kind of pie chart, 10% yeah. of the consumer is really trying to work on maybe some true medical thing, epilepsy, cancer, 
10% is out there trying to get as euphoric as possible. So like truly recreational, but 80% is just trying to get a better life, right? right. Helps them with their aches and pains. They want to get off some opiates, uh, helps them sleep at the end of the night, things like that. So it's exciting. Yeah. So what about, um, I mean, I kind of feel like cannabis is, is like, and I don't mean this in a bad way because oh it's going to sound go. bad, okay. but right. I do kind of feel like it's a little bit like the Bitcoin right now, right? Like it's all the rage. Sure. Like everybody's talking about it. Everybody's, you know, saying they're the biggest investor in it. I, every, I'm not just saying Cresco, but you hear all these other people like, well, we're opening up dispensaries. We're doing this. Like I'm in the marijuana field right now. Yep. Like I, I feel like it's a really hot topic. Like, why do you think that is? So a, it's come out of nowhere, right? So you have an industry again that can disrupt all of those components of healthcare, wellness, yeah. recreational. You can start a small business. Like I think America's built on small businesses. Yeah. The the concept of being able to start a dispensary in an area where yeah, you need a little bit of money, but you really need hard work, grit, and an idea. Is it easy to start like a dispensary? In some markets, like Colorado, you could move out to Colorado and get yeah. a dispensary license in an unlimited license framework. And it's like a store. I just opened yeah, a store. It's a store. Up? Okay. Yep. So it's like opening a liquor store in okay. some markets, right? That's Colorado and Oregon and Washington. California is technically an unlimited license market as well. Um, it's just then you have local jurisdictions that may say you can't put it here. Um, like close to a school or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and there's rules like that. But then literally like local townships can say, we don't want to participate in the cannabis program. So then you've got to turn your sales skills on and explain bit, yeah. to them on how. But so in theory, it's, it's really the next small businesses that can start. When you get into the cultivation manufacturing side and you're building 40,000 square foot buildings and it's you know, a $15 million yeah. project, that's a little bit different, but a little retail store, people can get in. So that's exciting. The other thing that's, it's, it's great and unfortunate at the same time is many people have had, almost everybody will have cancer touch their lives. Sure. It's an unfortunate fact. Yeah. As people are towards end of life and, and have alternatives of some type of opium based product or opiate based product compared to more of a palliative uh, cannabis situation, they've seen people react very well towards end of life. So they've had some family relationship that has utilized cannabis and had a beneficial impact on that loved one. Yeah. So I think that draws people to that as well. So I think a lot of people are fascinated by an up and coming industry. The actual opportunity to start a business is really cool. And then they've got this emotional tie. So all of those things combined make it a hot topic. How, how many do you, is there a lot of like dispensaries and different companies in Illinois? Like, like there's Cresco. How yeah. many other Cresco's yeah. are there? So, you know, what's, what's very interesting about Illinois is this was generation two of cannabis. It was a limited license market and you what had to mean? be professional. So instead of California or Colorado, where it's an unlimited number of licenses, the state of Illinois said, hey, we want a limited number of operators to control the cultivation manufacturing side and we want a limited number of dispensaries. And you do that to make sure the controls are in place and okay. you can monitor the program and you can make sure that product isn't getting shipped across state lines and breaking federal laws. So a, a relatively tight framework, just like Illinois has done with liquor licenses. There's not right. some unlimited number of liquor licenses. There's not some unlimited number of casinos. So yeah. putting it into a regulatory framework was something Illinois did. How many licenses are there in Illinois? So there's 21 cultivation licenses and 60 dispensaries. Okay. And then with the current bill that's on Governor Pritzker's desk, or soon to be, yeah. um, it will increase the number of dispensaries up to a maximum of 500. Okay. So you'll give opportunities for more people to apply for small businesses. Yeah. Um, there will be craft grows, so the opportunity to create grows and actually build out a 5,000 square foot grow in cultivation and start participating. There will be some format of uh, additional licenses, whether it's a a kind of a kitchen license so you can make your own products, but still under a controlled and regulatory framework, which is important. That's that's what excites guys like us about this business is the opportunity to create consistent quality products in a market with 13 million people. So there's 15 other pretty much competitors that are like Yeah, so Cresco. there's 21 licenses. There's, there's 14 of us that actually hold the licenses. Okay. And what's incredible is our peers here have really helped. This, this program was hard to start. So when it shifted from Governor Quinn to Governor Rauner, you went from a governor who supported this program to a governor who was not supportive of the program very early on. Yeah. Now you have Governor Pritzker who's came on and certainly has a much more compassionate uh, approach to cannabis, the opportunity from a revenue standpoint, all of those other components. But we function in this very difficult market in a regulated environment. A lot of our peers are the 
are the powerhouses in the industry as well. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the companies, GTI, Ataraxia, Pharmacan, a lot of are these Are these companies, your competitors? Yeah. And it's really cooperation. So right? you guys don't like hate. It's not like in, like in the mortgage industry where you guys like hated each other no. <laughs> and you're being cutthroat. I didn't like, hate anybody. Right, man. right. No, I know, I know. But I'm just saying like what hy- I'll say, what I'll hypothetically say about, speaking. Yeah, what yeah. I will say about this industry is it's one of the only industries I've ever seen where you can create a win-win-win. And my partner Charlie talks about that a lot, right? So there's the opportunity to help the community. There's the opportunity to to create jobs. There's the opportunity for companies to make money as well. So it's okay for companies to make money. It's great to be able to help the community, the employment, the tax in the in the state, all of these components, and and do the right thing, right? Whether it's addressing social equity issues early yeah. on, whether it's uh, addressing criminal justice reform, and also stewarding the next generation of revenue for this state. So it's an exciting industry. You don't, I don't have to take from somebody else right. for us to win. We can win alongside a lot of our peers. How are you guys? Like, how is your company like growing? Like in the last like year? Let's yeah. Say. So um, at any given time, we have about 500 open job postings out there. Wow. Uh, we, our team, who's phenomenal on the recruiting side, yeah. we we hired 100 people last month. Wow. Um, prior to that, we put out 100 job offers. So um, the how many, so how many rate, employees you got right now? So like we're today? at 1,100 employees. Wow, that's big. Um, so that's up more than double uh, since last year. Actually, it's up, I think, three times since last year. Uh, it's a very fast-paced growing industry as we're in 11 states. So we've grown our footprint um, as well as markets are improving, like Illinois and Pennsylvania and all these states are improving. Are you guys like advertising a lot? Like how, do you grow, how are you able to grow? So advertising is difficult. Again, it kind of goes back to our mortgage days where advertising is a very unique thing. When you advertise in, in mortgage or real estate, there's you, there's regulatory yeah, there's language. Yeah. So not all communications are advertisements. All advertisements are communications. So yeah. when we look at putting out pieces of information, we try to educate the consumer. Did you know cannabis is now available in the state of Illinois? That's a very different thing than come buy an ounce of cannabis for $99 at X location. Right. So understanding how you position your messaging to the consumers is how we get our brand out there. It's a lot different than kind of that come buy something, uh, uh, act of asking for something. But, but you were able to snag the guy from Nike, right? Yeah, so we've we've got, I mean, what's really exciting for us. What's his name us, again? Uh, Scott Wilson. I read that in Cranes. Yeah, Scott, yeah. Scott's had an incredible career. He's, He's done a big an deal. incredible amount of uh, design work over the years for, uh, again, he was at Nike. Yeah. He was at... Uh, his, his company, Minimal, does incredible things. Their office is super cool over in the West Loop. Um, you know, Xbox 360 and all of these neat things. He's running kind of the user experience for us. So he's our chief experience officer. Um, we've had just incredible talent. Guys coming from Big Beverage, guys coming from um, CPG, pharmaceutical, um, all, all walks of life. So that the ability to attract talent to this space is really neat. Do you think it's because it's something fun, innovative, and different, and people are kind of like sick of the kind of growth? Run it's the, really yeah, growth. Run people, the mill stuff. People, if you're at, you know, Kraft Foods is down 50% over the last few years. That's you not like fun going to work, right? Like, remember in the real estate, yeah. not everybody was diving into the real estate industry when it was on a decline. Yeah, in 2009, there wasn't people right. being like, let's Knocking get a real on estate your door. license. Now yeah. it's, it's, but growth industries, people like to be part of growing things, exciting things things that get them excited to come to work every day, and that's typically tied to revenue growth or industry growth. Yeah. Cannabis, fortunately, has both of those things where we're growing, you know, I think we grew 400% over last year. Um, that's a lot more exciting than an AB InBev that uh, lost 7% last year. So, you know, kind of pivoting a little bit, like what, what kind of products and services does this Cresco like offer out there? So we manufacture about 500 different products. Okay. Uh, range, and it's about 5,000 different SKUs. Okay. So, we don't need to go through all 500. Though. Yeah, I get it. Okay. So we, what we did when we got into this space, we developed a house of brands. Okay. And I think that's a big differentiator for us to some of our peers. We knew in Illinois, we were going to have two basic consumers. We were going to have a consumer who was comfortable with cannabis. It either used it before uh, and then you also were going to have a little old lady who never thought she'd use cannabis. So, but her oncologist told her to help her with a nausea from chemo. Yeah. So right out of the gate, we developed a house of brands. The remedy brand was for that little old lady, so to speak. It's a non-combustible product. So it's pills, patches, salves, sprays, lotions, tinctures, inhalers, all of those type of products. Right. Then we developed the Cresco brand, but it didn't play to the lowest common denominator, right? It's not tie-dyed or Jamaican flagged or little dancing bears. 
its professional version of cannabis, right. getting rid of indica, hybrid, and sativa, instead introducing rest, rise, and refresh. So talking to them about need states. Then we were fortunate to partner with Mindy Siegel, uh, James Beard award-winning pastry chef, killer restaurant hot chocolate over in Bucktown. Yeah. Um, great date place for sure. Yeah. Um, Mindy helped us launch our edibles line called Mindy's Kitchen as well as Mindy's Artisanal Edibles. So addressing that edible market, but people's experiences were edibles over the years were not great all the time. The consistency and quality of the product varied greatly. So we knew we could take the same measurement and dosing that we put in our pills, right. put it in the edibles, but again, just like we didn't know how to grow cannabis, none of us knew how to cook. So bringing in a phenomenal chef like Mindy, who could then flavor those edibles to make the best tasting edible, but it also is the most consistent edible out there, was exciting. So you were able to kind of like understand that, you know, if we're going to do an edible, we got to do it the, the right yeah, way. Yeah, and not just like the consumer have needs. a dude in a kitchen right. trying which, out some which stuff. Which like Mindy's uh, wins awards and stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, the Mindy's... Mindy's is the top selling edible in Las Vegas. Like she's won a, a multitude of awards. She's been on the cover of magazines. She's she's an incredible uh, steward for edibles within cannabis and, and really kick cooking within cannabis. So yeah. we're excited to have those type of partnerships and to do it with somebody local is awesome. What about like, so like growers, I'm assuming like, like so, I'm a big wine snob. I love wine, and, you, are you know, wines, like but only French wines, right? Uh, I like I like Napa cabs. Have you grown Napa up cabs yet? and Bordeaux. Oh, okay. That's Good. it. Yeah, but I mean, but like you know, there's famous like wine growers I follow. You know, sure. I follow them on Instagram, and like I, I buy like a lot of their stuff. I'm assuming like who bought you the best bottle of wine you've ever had? I, I will say, Josie did uh, the case of Maya. Like, yeah, I mean, it was uh, it's still I still have the box <laughs> in my house. Nice. Yeah, Good. yeah, it's unbelievable. Thank you for that, right. by the way. But. Um, I'm assuming there's going to be at some point like famous growers. Sure, that, there like, are some people. Follow. And, and, yeah, I, yeah, I'm ignorant to it. So is, is there certain people? Are you guys trying to target those guys too? You know, like, what we've done is we're trying as a company. We The goal for Cresco, the mission statement, is to normalize and professionalize cannabis. Right. So you've certainly had a culture that exists in cannabis for a very, very long period of time. Right. We're trying to marry that culture along with big agriculture. And we're trying to marry that culture with pharmaceutical quality production right so we're trying to bring in people who certainly understand the cannabis plant but also understand that you've got to hit consistent yields and it's not about some one-off plant that was the the greatest single piece of bud that has ever been grown right it's can you do it again and can you do it again and can you do it again so that is more our style of bringing in people who came from agriculture backgrounds yeah. have have get cannabis background as well marrying that into creating this outcome of professional and normalized cannabis. I just see it being like someday like we're like you you're branding a grower and people are buying your product because of it. Sure. There's going to be like the you celebrity growers. Yep. Yeah. Like and then you, you know have like the like, next top grower will be a movie or right. a TV show or something, right? I mean, I'm just saying like there's a lot of possibilities. We could actually brand more of the stuff to make some more money off For it sure. by the way, you know. ML MLG uh, Yeah, we'll back cannabis. a brand. We'll, we'll back, a, back one of the guys, you All know. Right, perfect. I, I mean, uh, are, are you guys targeting people like that though? Like You know, I would say we're not as celebrity focused on that yet. Yeah. We are we are more about creating a consistent quality outcome but what we're also doing is we launch more brands in our brand team and you mentioned scott and our and certainly yeah. the rest of our marketing team we'll launch like a cresco limited brand where we'll partner with either a celebrity talent we'll partner with a a, a known grower and there's certainly some out there and there's yeah. people that follow them on instagram um there's definitely a culture that exists that won't be the mainstay product for yeah, us, totally. but, but understanding similar to like sneakers and some of those those cultures that um, have created phenomenons of when somebody launches a shoe, you know, Gary yeah, like Vee launches Jordan's, a shoe. Right? Yeah, 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 or right. Gary Vee, yeah. But like, so I, like that, I know, like, you know, it's X guys like growing product and Cresco backs and sure. people are like, yeah, I'm only buying Cresco. Yeah, and it. you're seeing celebrities jump into it, right? Like I think Seth Rogen's now into the space. And, well, yeah, I can and, see him and uh, James Frankel probably. Yeah, right, they, yeah. You know, not, not sorry, the typecast, but it kind of seems like well, they're kind of I guess one it. question going back to kind of like the, nice the that competition. He's letting you talk a little bit, Joe. Yeah, yeah, he, does, he, he doesn't Every stop. Every now and then, yeah. He doesn't yeah. stop. Um, like... The barriers to entry, like, it, it seems like everyone always has an idea. Like, random random friends of mine are like, hey, man, I have, like, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Let's let's start a weed sure. business. Uh, do you see that being a problem? And, like, like do you see, uh, and, and, like, how long will there be just a couple big players that kind of take over the game, like a Coca-Cola and yeah, a Pepsi sure. or something? Like I think you'll see some consolidation in the industry for sure. I think what's exciting is those people can – if you have an idea, you have this incredible opportunity within this state, this country, whatever you want to use, 
to move forward with it, but it's, it's all about bias to action, right? The idea is like 1% of that overall yeah. piece that makes a company go. Um, having that bias to action and taking that idea and sourcing money and knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, surrounding yourselves with better people. Like if people can do that, I am all for them getting in this industry. What I get concerned about is bad actors getting in the space, people not getting into it for the right reason. It's not a cash grab because this industry is incredibly difficult. I think similar parallels to real estate. Like people look at some of these industries as like easy and I've got an idea and I could do this better. It's like, go and do it. I would love, I welcome that of people dump, jumping into this industry. It needs more good players. It needs more people with good ideas, but it needs a bias to action. They need to execute on those plans. Those are the things that need to happen. So I welcome, it's a growing industry. We need more people in it. We need better people in it every day. Um, but they need to be good actors. So the only the only thing I would say is I get concerned about why people get into it. It's not a cash grab. Like you're going to get get mowed over in this space if you don't have a plan and know your strengths and weaknesses and understand how you can differentiate yourself. Just like real estate, just like mortgage, just like other careers. Right. Yeah, I mean, and you mentioned bad apples. Now has has the kind of more main. I mean, marijuana or cannabis and stuff is kind of starting to go towards a little bit. Not, I wouldn't say mainstream, but people are starting to be a little bit more acceptable to it. Are you seeing crime get cut down because of like crime? Crime on the fact of like, let's say like sure. the you know eighteen year old that was buying marijuana in the corner off some guy. Like, is that cut down at all? Like, is that affected yeah, this? Yeah, I at mean, all? you're you're certainly disrupting the black market, right? Okay. Cannabis has been sold for five thousand years, right? Whether yeah. it's been legal, not legal, right? You know, it's not like this industry came out of nowhere. This product's been around. It's been part of cultures. Certain markets are different than others, right? Yeah. The, the California, the Venice Beach of the world is certainly more accepting than, you know, Omaha, Nebraska, right? right? I mean, certainly cultures um, have related to this product in a more meaningful way. I would say that by bringing things to tax and regulate, you, you actually get rid of the crime element of cannabis. It takes time because now you're talking about pricing. When you tax something, you have to typically sell for at or above what the black market is selling at. So then you have to explain the benefits to the customer about that product has been tested. It's grown without pesticides. Right. Some of these things that you don't know what you're getting from your guy, so to yeah. speak. Um, so explaining and educating that to the consumer is, is our job. Right. So short answer is yes, it's definitely short circuiting some of the black market. In some markets where enforcement is lax, that is not quite caught up. Like LA, for example, there's still a ton of illegal grows out there. They miss some of their tax revenue pieces. So hopefully now you'll see some enforcement come on to knock out some of the black market operations. Yeah. Uh, in a state like Illinois, cannabis has been here for a long time. Yeah. I will say that we certainly have a stronger regulatory framework towards enforcement if you have bad actors out there. So, you know, I'm, I, am all for the the supporting of the police and the other activities that it takes to enforce the laws of the land yeah the black um, market stuff yeah yep correct so it's definitely disrupting it yeah now what about so like you mentioned taxes and stuff like that now i don't know the stat but it to me it just kind of seems like smoking in general is down like the use of tobacco is down sure. i don't i don't know you know know the grand components of it but you know, you don't see people asking you, like, do you want the smoke or non-smoking section at restaurants like you or, did when you were a kid. Or in the airplane? Yeah, yeah. I was on a plane the other day that had a bolted shut ashtray. I mean, I'd be a little bit How nervous about holding that train. Yeah, is, like, right? like, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be sitting down on that. I'd be like, I'm away for the next one. But, you know, so, like, I'm assuming that the, the government's been hurting from the lack of taxes there. Now, uh, if marijuana, you know, becomes more mainstream and it becomes, like, something like cigarettes or something like that, um, is there is that tax going to help the, you know, the government yeah, out? Yeah, you're like, seeing or, it, right? Colorado ran at a surplus last year. Okay. So I don't know too many states. Illinois certainly doesn't run at a surplus. Wait, we're not doing good, right? Illinois uh, we're, not, doing we're not doing great. If you look oh. at your tax bill, it kind of shows a deficit yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. So states that have – cannabis brings a lot of things. Opiate deaths are down. Tax revenue is up. Those are two huge benefits for a state, and I think why you're seeing the governor of Illinois looking at rec uh, recreational – not only the governor – the House, the Senate, all of the various committees, it seems like we have an opportunity to push a bill forward well, here. How are, and you mentioned opiates. Like, I mean, I've had, I've personally had a lot of my, like, good friends die from opiates yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, I've never understood, like, how those are legal uh, 
and I know, you know, the facts firsthand of what's happened to it. And something like marijuana is ill. Like, why is that? Like, yeah, do you I know mean, what? You know, there's a lot of stories about, that, about like, um, why cannabis or marijuana was illegal, and and it goes back to racial things is really one of the driving factors. Like under the Nixon administration, um, so there's certainly some component of that. Um, you know, opiates serve a purpose. I think I, I would first say that. Like, if you go and broke a leg and are are going under surgery or recovering that day from surgery, opiates serve a purpose. It's the long-term use of opiates and yeah. how it interacts with your brain to create that addiction right. um, is the scary part. So cannabis creates that long-term palliative care of instead of taking an opiate, you can take a non-addictive product like cannabis um, that's never been known to kill anybody. Um, the opportunity to replace opiates was one of the things that the last administration does do a good jo- did do a good job of we introduced an opiate replacement bill that if you have an opiate prescription you could take that prescription and actually go get cannabis with it um to try to like help weed you off the correct. opiates yep. give so you something else very very positive other states new york pennsylvania have rolled out a similar platform because the opiate epidemic is it's certainly getting it's attention now it's been terrible for many years yeah um you know and it's unfortunate it took like disrupting white suburbia yeah. to get that attention that it needed. But, um, you know, yeah, I think we've all been impacted by it. And it's unfortunate it took a lot of deaths to start bringing that to light. But, you know, the pharmaceutical industries are powerful, powerful yeah. industries. Well, you know, you talk about how powerful they are. What's the odds that they start trying to get in the space to try to make up for that, you know, yeah, they, the they, revenue? So they had an opportunity to kind of take this space over early on. Yeah, They could have rescheduled the drug. They had the ability to kind of navigate their way in. They took a much more um, interesting and antiquated approach of saying, oh, no, it's not going to help anybody. They took the blockbuster approach. Yeah, right. They're like, they, hey, we have Netflix, <laughs> but like, like ah, right. I, th- I think we'll keep these uh, video yeah. stores on the sidelines. So instead. I think they tried to play more defense than being a part of what could it look like. Sure. So then the alcohol and beverage industry really stepped in and it's going more towards a descheduling of cannabis than it is a rescheduling of cannabis. But I do think, you know, as, as I mentioned early on, the wellness and lifestyle and the fun side of cannabis kind of sit over on the alcohol, tobacco, lifestyle situation. Yeah. There's still an incredible opportunity for pharma to get involved. Like, why do people say that this helped shrink tumors? Why do people say that this helped with their epilepsy? Why do people say there's got to be something to it? There's way too much anecdotal stuff out there about successes so the pharmaceutical industry still controls the majority of the purse strings so dumping research dollars into cannabis to find some alternative to chemo or whatnot um is is really exciting and that's where you'll see them the r d research that it takes to get through phase one phase two phase three trials to kind of like show like you're talking about like showing like all the health benefits too yeah the health benefits are going to come at some point and that's that's going to be really exciting you know for all of cresco's strengths like we're not doing FDA style research, right? right? That's a that's multiple billions of dollars in multiple years, and you need big pharma to come in and start looking at that. And I think they will. Um, they need kind of the at this point, they need some type of descheduling, rescheduling, um, passing of some of these bills out there to get them comfortable with the space. So, like, what are some of the health benefits that like Cresco's like touts that? It has the Well, so stuff. with it not being an FDA approved product, you can't talk about health benefits. Got right? It. You can say that people have um, been known to experience positive results or Got you, it. you, it's not, you can't come out and say this does this. Right. Um, until like they do. So that's what you're saying. Like until they do that billions of research and FDA puts their stamp that says, correct. hey, this is it's for proven this. that yeah. it's, it shrinks that tumor. Until then, it's just kind of more or less yeah, it's anecdotal right okay. you can see some some research i encourage people like go on our website at crescolabs.com there is medical research on there there are papers published by revered doctors um certainly countries like israel is doing a lot of research canada is doing a lot of research yeah. other markets are really starting to take a more proactive approach um there are harvard business journals or harvard medical journals on this is there uh, any Eastern Illinois journals on this? No, I don't think that. I don't okay. think they're, uh, okay. you know, <laughs> maybe we hired some people from to work in the uh, facility. Um, but, uh, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff out there. So what about the future? Are you able to talk about, like, where, where Cresco is going in the future? Sure. You know, I mean, as a public company, we went public on December 3rd. So And just so in Canada, right? It, it's listed on the CSE, the Canadian Securities Exchange, and then you can also buy through the OTC. Um, okay. But so... As, as Cresco continues to grow, we're in 11 states. 
Um, those are important states, right? It's Illinois, it's Pennsylvania, it's New York, it's California, it's Florida, yeah. um, Massachusetts, a multitude of what we would deem important states. The goal for us is to continue to outperform our peers in those footprints yeah. and become the most important cannabis company in the country. So that means going deeper into those states, looking at M&A opportunity in those states, but also we're excited about the potential for a recreational adult use in Illinois and being at the forefront of that and making sure we're well positioned to make sure the consumers of Illinois have product as well as the medical patients of Illinois have products. I feel like a lot of people already assume that it's going to be recreational, uh, like uh, federal, mm -hmm. like wide, uh, sure. sooner or later. Um, is that kind of the the same assumption that most people in the industry are getting as well? Yeah, it's not if, it's when okay. is really what it is. You know, certainly D.C. is a interesting place. There's been 40 plus cannabis bills that have sat out in Congress in one form or another. But you had a gentleman by the name of Pete Sessions, who was a a house rep from Texas who sat as kind of the linchpin of what bills got called to the floor in the house. So when it was a Republican controlled house, none of these bills got called to the floor, even though they might pass. Now with a Democrat controlled house, you're going to see bills like the SAFE Act, which would allow more normal banking in the city banks and chases of the world to potentially participate in the space. That bill comes out, um, hopefully passes this year, L mixed reviews, but, but fairly bullish on the opportunity for that passing. Then you have the States Act, which would actually create some level of federal legality. Um, it wouldn't make it federally legal, but what it would do is say, okay, we're pushing this to the states. You guys have the right to decide. Do you want to be a non-participating state, a medical state, or a recreational state? So it gives them kind of federal coverage. Those bills are how this starts to change. And it's not really a matter of if, it's when. It's, it's whether the they get it done prior to a presidential election or if the Democrats want it to be a presidential topic so more young voters come out and support cannabis and the Democrat candidate, or the Republicans want to get it done in advance of that so it's not a presidential topic, right? So now you're getting into the weird dynamics that exist in Washington. But oh, I think, thanks. Yeah, which I try not to, I, I don't pont I pontificate on a lot, Joe, but uh, that one's tough. Um, what I'll say is, I think the stance though is, is when, not if. What would you say? What would you say would be like the largest uh, like fear or challenge to the entire industry, like going forward? You know, if if we regressed in time, right? If the if more Jeff Sessions of the world come out, it just doesn't seem like that that type of person. You're seeing little ladies in Florida and nine year old grandmothers utilize cannabis. So even that baby boomer plus generation who was the anti cannabis generation even come out and support it and try it now. So regulatory risk is always probably number one. Um, I would say that's the biggest concern that could really take this backwards. It's just now you've got 30 plus states that participate in some cannabis program. California is recreational, right? I think that's like the eighth largest economy in the world. Um, yeah. It's going to be hard to put toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. What? And then you got, um, by the way, Joe Ruick here is one of the biggest supporters and investors of Cresco Labs <laughs> as well. So we're happy to have you on board, Joe. Yeah, we got we're, that's a big thing we're seeing too now is, is talking about people talking, um, you know, wanting to open a dispensary and stuff. You're, you're seeing a lot more people want to, especially younger people want to invest in companies like yours and stuff like that, which is yeah, and is, it gives an opportunity like the e trades of the world will actually support like you can go on e trade and Ameritrade yeah. and some of those um, brokerage accounts yeah. to invest in a company like Cresco, yeah, whereas the big behemoth large bulge bank uh like the chases and and um wells fargo's of the world don't let you actually even invest in companies like us so Are, is it true that uh all the cannabis companies they they're not even allowed to put the money into banks so the federal banks right so okay. any of the big multinational banks like chase and wells fargo we've had banking since we started coming from again drawing parallels on our previous industry we've been able to sit down with banks and typically they're state chartered banks uh, but I think we work with 24 different banks. That doesn't make sense for a company that's doing what we do to have that many different bank accounts. But we need banks in every state. Um, then you want a backup bank in every state that you operate in. In theory, it'd be better to have one or two banks. I mean, it'd make our CFO's life a lot easier. But we've been able to bank. We've been able to get debt on real estate. We've been able to do things, again, taking our professional backgrounds and applying that to become a competitive advantage. Nice. Yeah. Well, um, well, we have something we call the Fast Five or the Coho Assess Five Questions. Joe, what, what do we got here? 
Uh, so You're gonna let him? Mm -hmm. Okay, go. So the, fa the fast five. Uh, so, so what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Best piece of advice I've ever received. Um, you know, it's funny. I uh, work harder, not smarter, which I know is unique. But I think you have to work harder first before you can work smarter. A lot of people try to work smarter first and develop some incredibly intuitive way to solve a problem without having Someti to work. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard work first, then you can work smarter. Yeah. I agree with that. Uh, do you love to win or do you hate to lose? I love to win. Oh man. All right. Why you love, you hate to lose. I hate to lose. Uh, I the hate opportunity. To lose. I mean, I grew up playing tennis, right? Like yeah. I wanted to win. I never wanted my opponent to lose. I wanted to pound him into the ground and yeah. win. Um, it's I, a much better feeling. I get to hate yeah, to lose. I just hate it. Like, the wins are great, but, like, losing is just like, I can't. That's a different I question, right? Yeah. Would I rather win or not lose? Um, yeah. That's probably a little different, but yeah. I think I would, uh, yeah. Uh, who was your biggest hero? Um, biggest hero, like, that I knew? Doesn't uh, matter. Anybody, anybody that you draw that you think is your absolute biggest hero that you've looked up to for who knows how long. I mean, the Lou Gehrig story is pretty incredible to yeah. never miss a day of work. Um, to go out on top like that is is pretty inspiring. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad's certainly been a hero to face adversity and have a kid with cancer and go through all that and um, raise a fairly normal kid uh, that sits in front of you, I guess. Semi-normal. Yeah, right. It could be debated. But, um, <laughs> you know, definitely my dad, my mom as well, same, same kind of – I put them on the same level. But the Lou Gehrig story is pretty incredible to me. Yeah. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, be invisible. All right. That's, 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 that's awesome and, and creepy uh, at the same time. Yeah. And, and the last of the five cues is what makes you Chicago? Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've had a boat he, in he's Chicago secretly for a New long Yorker. time, right? I, uh, I give a pretty good uh, uh, river tour. Uh, my, my version of the architectural tour is, it is, a nice is boat. second to none. So um, I would say that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a Yankee fan. I but will, you, I you like Chicago more than New York, right? Um, I, no, I don't know that I'd say that. I love Chicago. It's a phenomenal place to live, um, but New York is the epicenter of the world. Um, it's debatable. So, uh, so <laughs> where can people find you and what would you want to plug? Uh, so, you know, crescolabs.com is, is our website. There's a ton of information on there. Um, you know, that, that would be what I would encourage everybody to get to or stateofrelief.com. Okay. So make sure to tune into our next episode and subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening to the Matt Lercy Project. Oh,